Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The G20 meeting of world leaders finished yesterday. Today, doctors in Aleppo have reported that a chlorine attack has hospitalised dozens of people, most of them children. Barrel bombs that appear to have been filled with an irritant fell this afternoon in an opposition-held area in the city's southwest. Channel 4 News has received disturbing images of the chaos that followed. Fatima Manji has this report. No older than four or five years old, her oxygen mask slips off. She tries to fix it herself, but her hand is shaking too much. No one seems to notice. In this Aleppo hospital, there are too many other patients needing urgent help. More are brought in, their clothes stripped off, their bodies hosed down. If it's chlorine they've been hit with, as doctors here suspect, they need to act fast. These pictures filmed for Channel 4 News show the immediate aftermath. Fearful of contaminated clothes, patients are given pink scrubs. This toddler's having his pulse checked to monitor any toxicity in his blood. He's calm, yet confused. And no wonder how to make sense of scenes like this. The suspected chlorine attack hit Aleppo's opposition held a Sukkuri neighborhood this afternoon. Syria's second largest city is divided by the country's bloody civil war. Rebel groups control the east, the government the west. We were carrying one child out after another. This area is full of civilians and there's no military base around. This one of the canisters apparently containing the gas. A UN inquiry says the Syrian government has used chlorine gas in two attacks, in 2014 and 2015. It's always denied this. But if this attack is confirmed, the regime has again flagrantly disregarded international law. Doctors report at least 70 cases of suffocation today, but no deaths. <laughs> the nurse asks this child's name. She's told no one knows. They took him out of the ambulance all alone. Just two days ago, Presidents Obama and Putin met to discuss Syria failing to make tangible progress. And now, yet again, it's Syrian children feeling the effects of that failure. Fatima Manji reporting. Now, those images were filmed today in Aleppo by Wa'ad al-Khatib. The Saudi Foreign Minister Adel al-Jabir has told this program today that a ceasefire in Syria could be agreed in the next 24 hours. For although Mr al-Jabir has condemned the Assad regime and the Russians for their bombing campaign, the Saudis themselves face charges of hypocrisy because of their renewed air campaign aimed at dislodging Houthi rebels in Yemen. Tomorrow, the Saudi foreign minister will urge MPs in Westminster not to suspend British arms sales to Saudi Arabia. But today, he spoke to our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman, who began by asking him about the future of President Assad. The Syrian people will not accept that a man who leads them is responsible for the murder of 400,000 people and the displacement of 12 million people and the destruction of a country. It's just inconceivable that he would have any kind of future in Syria. So the question is how to transition and when. But the transition has to take place. What's your response to the fact that the Russians and the Americans who, who met recently have failed so far to negotiate a ceasefire? I believe, uh, I wouldn't describe it as a failure, I think that it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, there is a possibility of arriving at an understanding and over the next 24 hours or so, uh, and then we will test the seriousness of Bashar al-Assad and his allies in terms of complying with the, a ceasefire like this. But if you're a civilian in Aleppo, you dread talk of a ceasefire, because every time there are talks, the bombing, and particularly the Russian aerial bombardment, intensifies. That's correct. He has proven himself to try to be provocative and brutal in staging attacks immediately before negotiations are supposed to take place in order to make it very difficult for the Syrian opposition to come to those talks. That's been the way he has operated since the beginning of this crisis and I personally don't think there's any reason to expect him to change. The Russians and others could 
of course, accuse you of hypocrisy here because of the renewed bombing campaign by Saudi Arabia in Yemen. And we see that a school and a hospital were hit last month. Well, I wouldn't say a renewed bombing campaign by Saudi Arabia. This is a war that we did not start. This is a war that was started by the Houthis and Saleh. When the talks collapsed, we have every right to defend our border, and we proceeded to do so. With regards why, why to are you still hitting hospitals? I mean, it seems odd that a, a campaign that started in March last year, you would think it would become more accurate in its targeting, yeah, but, but you still hit four hospitals run by Médecins Sans Frontières. I think that your statement is not fair. I think that your statement is not accurate. I think that your statement is biased. Would you ask the So Houthis? you haven't hit four hospitals? I will get to it in a second. Would you ask the Houthis why they deployed child soldiers? Would you ask the Houthis why they laid they siege but on the towns Houthis are and not villages? State actors. They're not a on, sovereign government on like towns you. Towns and villages, they're a combatant. On towns and villages, why they starve people, why but Saudi they Saudi Arabia must operate to a higher standard. If I, surely. May, if I may make my point. No, but I, I, I but you're, you're, you're point. equating Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. I'm, but surely I'm the saying, point is that Saudi no, Arabia is no, a sovereign government. No, I'm pointing out what you call hypocrisy of Saudi Arabia, I call hypocrisy of some in the media who look at one side and don't look at the other. We have an investigation unit that we put together. And you've investigated investiga eight, eight no, strikes? No, there are more than 20 in the pipeline. Every, every item that we get, we look at and we intend to look at. And, and, and what have intend, you discovered so far? And we intend to be transparent about it. Read the report. Have you read the reports? I've, I've read that have you read the report them? found that only one of eight strikes was a, a down to an intelligence failure. OK, so we acknowledge wrongdoing like every government does. And we put in place procedures to ensure that it doesn't happen again. But then after this that report... This is what Great Britain does, this that, is what America does. What I don't understand, Minister, is that after that report, you carried on bombing targets and, and hit a school and a hospital. Yeah, but, and we're investigating them. Now, keep in mind that the Houthis have used hospitals and schools, not as hospitals and schools, but as weapons depots. And so when you destroy it as a legitimate military target, they come back and say, oh, this used to be a hospital. Well, maybe six months ago it was a hospital. Maybe six months ago it was a school. When it was hit, the, the ass assessment that we had was that it was a military facility. Now, if it turns out to be incorrect, we will fix the problem and we will deal with it according to international humanitarian law. Do you get any indication from your British and American counterparts that they are considering suspending uh, selling arms to Saudi Arabia because of this controversy, or do you think it will carry on? No, we don't get in, uh, these indications. Britain and America are allies. They know how, how this war started. They know that we have a legitimate purpose in this war. They know we are being extremely careful in minimizing civilian casualties, and they know that we have in place a mechanism to investigate and make sure that we take procedures that prevent any repetition of mistakes from happening, just like happens in, in all wars. Jonathan Rugman there. Now to a debate that has been raging for months. Have British-made weapons been used by Saudi Arabia in Yemen in attacks that breach international law? Attacks indeed on hospitals, markets and residential areas. MPs on the Arms Export Committee are due to decide whether to call for a ban on such sales tomorrow. But before they do that, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister, who's in the UK, will brief them personally in an attempt to head off a ban. Saudi Arabia is the UK's biggest arms customer. In the last six years alone, the government here has licensed £6.7 billion worth of arms to the kingdom. £2.8 billion of that has been granted since the bombing began in Yemen last March. The largest deal was a £1.7 billion contract for combat aircraft, thought to have been largely BAE's Eurofighter Typhoons, while £62 million worth of paveway bombs have been sold, the type human rights campaigners say have been found in the Yemen rubble. Saudi Arabia, one of the world's biggest military powers. It showed off just a small portion of what it has today. These troops, these arms are being deployed to protect the Hajj pilgrimage. But over the border in Yemen, where the Saudi-led coalition is targeting rebels, it's accused of war crimes of hitting a school and an MSF hospital with indiscriminate strikes. MPs are deciding whether to call for an end to arms sales from Britain. The Saudi foreign minister will meet some tomorrow and tell them they shouldn't. We are extremely careful about being proportional. We are extremely careful about minimizing civilian damages. Why do we want to kill Yemenis? 
They're our neighbors. They have been for thousands of years. Do we really want the next three generations of Yemenis to hate us? Of course and, not. And yet you have and killed make, Yemenis. And, when, and, and, when and, when mistakes, killed. and when mistakes are made, they're acknowledged. Do I see anyone criticizing the Houthis for lobbing ballistic missiles into Saudi Arabia and killing our citizens? Our men and, and women so, and, and so children. what would you say to MSF then, who say that this campaign has been indiscriminate? I think that's, uh, that's not an accurate description on their part, unfortunately. We talk to, to MSF. We work with MSF, we cooperate with MSF in Yemen as well as in other parts of, of the region. And they and, give you and the coordinates we, of their facilities in And we will continue to do so. Yemen. How many times do I have to say, sometimes mistakes are made, sometimes you get faulty intelligence. And yet a UN panel has accused the Saudis of widespread and systematic attacks. Given the role of British hardware, should arms deals now be reviewed? Theresa May says she met with um, Saudi officials at the G20. How did that discussion go? Excellent. Excellent. As any discussion between leaders of two allied countries who have a historic relationship, Great Britain is one of Saudi Arabia's closest allies and strongest partners in all areas. She didn't raise concerns about what's happening in Yemen. I'm not going to get into the private uh, conversations that take place between leaders, but I can tell you that Great Britain and Saudi Arabia are historic allies. The Saudis say the relationship is about more than money, but some MPs are uncomfortable that a conflict that's cost hundreds of lives has also supported a multi-billion pound trade for Britain. Rohit Katru, News at 10. Newsnight has seen a leaked report which suggests that the government may be heading for a major embarrassment over its continued support for British arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Over the past year, our reporter Gabriel Gatehouse has repeatedly documented the targeting of civilians and civilian infrastructure, including factories and hospitals, in the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen. And yet, as late as yesterday, the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson defended British arms sales to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen, saying the campaign is not in clear breach of international humanitarian law. But as Gabriel has now learned, that Commons Committee of Arms Experts Controls takes a very different and damning view. What's the story? Well, Kirsty, a bit of background to this. Uh, in July this year, on the last day of Parliament before the summer recess, in what's known as Take Out the Trash Day, the day when the government releases potentially embarrassing information, the Foreign Office made a rather startling admission. Uh, when it had said over a period of six months that the government had assessed that Saudi Arabia wasn't in breach of international humanitarian law in Yemen. It admitted it had made no such assessment at all. It had, in fact, relied on Saudi assertions. Now, you mentioned uh, Boris Johnson's continued support for arms sales to Saudi Arabia, saying there wasn't enough evidence uh, to suggest that Saudi Arabia was committing war crimes. Well, this report from the uh, Committee on Arms Export Control, it's a draft report, but it concludes the opposite. It says that the weight of evidence is now so great that the UK should suspend arms sales to Saudi Arabia for use in Yemen until an independent and international inquiry can establish the truth. Now, both sides in this conflict have been accused of committing war crimes, but the UN says 60% of the civilian casualties are caused by Saudi-led airstrike. This program, as you said, um, has highlighted the targeting of civilians. We were in Yemen uh, last year um, seeing that and, and we travelled then with our colleague from the Arabic service, Nawal al-Magafi. She's just been back to Yemen uh, for a documentary for Our World. She's come back and here is some of what she found. Yemen has been under constant bombardment for the last 18 months. A conflict between Houthi rebels and a Saudi-led coalition. Both sides have been accused of war crimes, but it is the Saudis that the UK and its Western allies are backing. I was in Houthi-held territory in Abs in northern Yemen three weeks ago, when a nearby Medicine Sans Frontiers hospital was hit by a Saudi airstrike. This footage was filmed by local residents immediately after the attack, which ended up killing 19 people. All the patients were at ease. Some were sleeping. There were sleeping children and there were mothers giving birth. There were no problems at all. There were no Houthis or any armed people in the hospital. Only the doctors and nurses who work here. At around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, patients, doctors, nurses here could hear aeroplanes flying overhead. 
they didn't think it would strike, not only because this is a residential area, but because this is a hospital. But an airstrike did hit right over here by the emergency room, killing at least 15 people. People lost their jobs and homes. All of this is nothing compared to the loss of people's life. They are innocent. Who is responsible for what is happening to us? Saudi Arabia claims that the targeting of the hospital was a mistake. But MSF insists that all parties to the conflict have been provided with clear GPS coordinates of the hospital's location. It is markings for the coalition to know it's a hospital. They were fully aware and we contact them on a daily basis and tell them of MSF's whereabouts. And this logo is painted on the roof to differentiate this building from all other buildings. And yet they still bombed this hospital. 19-year-old Ayman was a local MSF volunteer. He had just driven his ambulance through the hospital gates when the airstrike hit. He and the patients in the back of his ambulance were all killed. He came home at 1 p.m. to have lunch and went back to work. At 3 o'clock, we heard the bombing of the airstrike. I was screaming, my son, my son, my son. They told me he was in the hospital. Someone else said he was in the ambulance, so I ran there myself. I found my son underneath the cupboards, completely burnt, like a piece of coal. This was the fourth MSF hospital to have been destroyed in this conflict. The charity has now withdrawn from northern Yemen. The country's infrastructure has been devastated. Meanwhile, nearly 4,000 Yemeni civilians have been killed and another 6,000 injured. That was uh, Nahal al magafis report there. So exactly what is in the committee report? Well, the committee is made up of MPs from four other select committees, Defence, Foreign Affairs, International Development and Business, all the committees that are involved in the export of arms. Now, this copy that we've got hold of is a draft. The committee will meet tomorrow to discuss possible changes, so we don't know what the final language um, is going to sound like. But as it stands, uh, the report says that the weight of evidence of violations of international humanitarian law by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen is now so great that it is very difficult to continue to support Saudi Arabia while maintaining the credibility of our arms licensing regime. Now, in the summary, it says that given the scale and the history of UK arms exports to Saudi Arabia, it is, quote, inevitable, it seems inevitable, that any violations of international law by the Saudi-led coalition would involve arms supplied by the UK and the fact that the government has not supported efforts to establish an independent international inquiry, the report says, quote, has allowed for the transfer of items to Saudi Arabia very possibly in contravention of the UK's legal obligations. And while doubt and uncertainty about IHL compliance in Yemen exists, the default position of the UK government should not be to continue to sell weapons, i.e. To suspend weapon sales. So what does the law say about this? So the law says that licenses must not be granted where there is a clear risk that items might be used in the commission of serious violations of international humanitarian law. That's quite broad. The question is whether, as the government contends, there is insufficient evidence to support that. This report concludes that there's ample evidence. Now, the government says it has one of the strictest licensing regimes anywhere in the world, although since the conflict began, uh, it hasn't refused a single export license to Saudi Arabia. This is what the draft uh, report has to say on the matter. We have found that the government's arms export licensing regime, which it repeatedly asserts is robust, is in fact to a large extent opaque, and the government too often relies on assertion rather than positive evidence. But what weight does the committee report actually have, will have, when it comes out? Well, the committee has weight, uh, but it doesn't have the power to force the government to change policy. It does have the power to force it uh, to come and 
explain itself in front of the committee. But there's another thing going on. There's a legal case. The campaign group campaign against the arms trade is taking uh, the government to court over its arms sales to Saudi Arabia. It will go to judicial review. There'll be a hearing um, early next year. And I've spoken to their lawyers this evening. They've told me that they've written to the MOD and the FCO urgently seeking clarification about these assertions uh, that they'd assessed, the government had assessed that Saudi Arabia wasn't in breach mm. of international humanitarian law. They say that the government has apparently placed inaccurate and misleading statements before the court. They haven't yet heard back. Gabriel, thanks very much indeed. I've been getting away with it all my life.